What's up, everybody? Hope everyone is having a great day so far. I am here with a local Miami radio legend, Brian the Beast, Le Brian the Beast London. Brian, welcome to the show, man. Please uh, introduce yourself to anyone that out of state that doesn't know you. Yeah, what's up, everybody? Uh, Brian London is the the birth name. The Beast is my moniker. Uh, I've been around the Canes program since I started out going to school there in 1994 and was on uh, all the student broadcasts at WVUM for those years and uh, then uh, joined up with WQAM after graduating, actually before I graduated, uh, in 97 and uh, was closely uh, by the Canes team, uh, first as an executive producer of the Canes broadcast and then the sideline reporter and everything else and i've been covering the team ever since and uh yeah that's me man that's that's awesome. uh that was my uh, my previous life now i'm just stuck in my guest room <laughs> brian thank you so much for joining the show man you like you mentioned man you've been covering miami hurricanes football for quite a while man can you compare coach diaz's first year to other head coaches that you've witnessed their first year at miami the good and the bad yeah, I mean, listen, um, most – well, here's the thing. Let's let's go back in the history of the University of Miami. The Miami uh, Hurricanes have not historically um, gotten head coaches with a lot of big-time experience, um, and I think that's important to remember. Mark Richt, I think, is the guy that's had the most experience as a head coach. Um, yeah. Certainly, uh, Howard Schnellenberger – um, having his involvement with the 72 Dolphins and also with uh, Alabama, um, had a ton of uh, experience, but not as a head coach um, coming into Miami. So so for Miami, um, having a new head coach or a guy that's just learning on the job is not a new thing. I can tell you uh, stories about Butch Davis, his first game on the job, 1995, was a road trip to L.A., and Butch was so nervous – that he was screaming and yelling at parents in the lobby of the hotel to get away from his kids um, because he didn't think that parents or friends or anyone should be around his kids the night before a game. And Miami got clobbered in that game out uh, at the Rose Bowl. So, um, and it, you know, that that's just one anecdote of the many I could tell you about first time head coaches at the University of Miami. So, Manny Diaz, I think his. Um, I, I really like uh, Manny's acumen, and I like um, – I really think he's astute, and I think he knows what the program needs. I think he felt like coming in last year that he could um, maybe uh, – I would say let some of his assistants do more without his involvement, if you will, uh, that he could step back and just be that – that guy that just was the head coach without his hands, without his tentacles in every aspect of the program. Um, and I think what he found out is that uh, the team wasn't ready for that, that they needed somebody to be hands-on, quite involved, day-to-day, -day, day in, day out with the program. And I think that's why um, I think that's why the season went the way it did. And I think Manny even admitted that um, when he said, Hey, I got to get back on with the defense. I got to get back involved, but it wasn't just the defense. It was really everything. The head coach really needed to be involved in every aspect of the program to keep uh, things going the right way. That didn't happen, but I think he learned his lesson. Absolutely. And speaking of the defense, quick question. Do you think you'll have more of a hand in the de defense this year? <clears throat> Last year was under Blake Baker. A little bit different. Still 13 overall in total defense. People were a little bit upset. Um, do you think Manny is going to be more heavily invested? Um, I would hope that he would be. I think he's a really a great defensive mind. Um, okay. So I, I, I would hope that he definitely would be more involved. I don't know. It's hard to tell. Um, you might ask me a lot of questions that are going to predict what's going to happen this season. Right. Um, and without there being a full spring practice, yeah. without there being a spring game for me to watch, without there being, um, you know, just a lot of there's just a lot of unknowns for so for me to predict 
what he's going to do, what the team is going to do is really hard. I would just say this, uh, not only as a fan, but just as a follower of the team and somebody that's there every game and, and, and listens to Manny and talks to Manny. Um, I would hope that he would be more involved with the defense. Absolutely. I think it's, it's, it's really, um, I think it's just part of his skill set that's really good. Hey, B, speaking of spring football being canceled, how big of an impact is this going to take on this program? And all a lot of other programs in college football, there is no strength and conditioning right now going on. Lifting chairs, <laughs> lifting your couch is not a strength and conditioning program. Uh, I would love to hear your take. Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's put it this way. One, everyone's on an even playing field, right? Right. Uh, it, well, unless they're drastically cheating, which uh, I guess if we look at the SEC, we might find some of that. But um, everyone's on an even playing field. Everyone's going through the same thing. Um, and uh, so that puts Miami with everybody else. But you know what I, I think that I like is, and you talk about kind of these home workouts and what have you. Men, um, I don't mean to get uh, nostalgic, but the best thing about – Miami's championship teams. Um, if you go back and talk to the guys that were on the 83 team, if you did the 87, 89, 91, and then 2001, all of those teams, they were all player led and they all went and did when it came to working out and off season and all of that stuff. Um, they, they took it upon themselves to do it. So, I, I would say this. I've seen. Yeah, I, I would love for them to to be in an organized strength and conditioning program and what have you. But you know what? I don't need to see f a flickering lights and mat drills uh, to 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 be uh, to be positive about this team. I just need to know that the guys are talking with each other, and it sounds like they are about making sure they're in shape, making sure they do the right things, and get their body ready for whenever the season starts. Gotcha. And Beast, what, what are some positives you could take away of a first-year head coach you saw in Manny Diaz? And then we can go over what things he needs to address into next season. Well, I mean, listen, the positives are is he saw things that were wrong with the program. And, yes, and I think he has addressed them. So it's kind of a, a, a two-part question, but it all fits in the same thing, which is he understood that he took way of a too, too much of a step back. He got himself more involved. Um, he understands that he had to change the offense, um, and he did. He understand he understood that there was a deficiency at quarterback. He went out and got one. Um, yeah. So the, he sees problems and he goes to fix them. Um, he's not too hard headed. He's not Mark Richt who refused to fire his son. Um, he's not somebody that's just too prideful in order to get the job done. He. Um, is really calculated and 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 I really like his um, you know listen he comes off as this very kind of like fun dude with swag and he's like all 305 and all that stuff man right. he's really bright he's really astute um, and I think he gets it and I think that's I think that's a good thing um, I think that I think that he's the, the biggest thing about Manny is he sees a mistake um, and the thing that he learned is, whereas in the beginning of his coacher tenure, he may have relied on his, his assistants to fix those mistakes. Now he's taking it with his hands and fixing mistakes one by one by one. Absolutely, Beast. And you got to love it. You know, we've seen coaches in the past. I think being stubborn, Al Golden, to be honest, he brings in a defensive coordinator like Manny Diaz. He may still be our head coach. Mark Rick did not want to fire his son, he did not want to give away player duties um, to his son. To uh, didn't want to give away play calling duties as well. One thing though about Manny Diaz, and this is where I'm going to question him: Can he get rid of specific coaches under the Manny Diaz coaching tree? People that he's brought up, Coach Packy. Look at his resume. I don't think he fits the linebackers coach position at Miami. Look at it, look. Just taking a look at his resume, I know a lot of people are tough on Coach Mike Rumpf as a cornerbacks coach, because he can't reel in the top cornerback recruits. Are, are you, are you fine right now with Miami's defensive staff or? I think anyone, uh, I'll be honest with you. And, and maybe I'm biased and maybe it's also because I'm old, uh, not really old, but older. Um, whereas, um, Hey, Donnie Hudson, what's going on, buddy? Uh, Donnie was one of the, by the way, if I may real quick, 
Donnie is one of the dudes that when I was laid off, he reached out from nowhere to offer me a job. And uh, he's awesome. He's a huge Canes fan. He made me a turnover chain, uh, which is amazing. And he's uh, a great, a great dude. So, and I love his wife too. But anyways, uh, so, uh, but um, the, 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 the thing about, now I'm trying to get my, my, my thought process back on, which is, uh, where were we? Just set me up again, man. I'm talking about, um, you know, his stubbornness and replacing the offensive staff, but the defensive staff. Right. Okay. So uh, here's where I may be biased, um, because I know Mike Rumpf really personally, uh, okay. We used to uh, we used to live blocks apart um, in Broward. Uh, obviously, I covered him extensively when he was on the team. Um, we're not too far apart in uh, in age and what have you. Um, I love Mike Rumpf. I think he's a great coach. And here's the thing about college coaching: um, you usually have your guys that are X's and O's coaches, and then you have you got your guys that are recruiters. Yes. Um, and it's, it's, and every once in a while you you strike gold with a guy that can do really both really well. Um, and the, the thing about making a staff up is you have to have the right amount of X's and O's guys and the right amount of recruiting guys. And for it to all come together with chemistry and hard work and all that stuff for the staff to work. Now you talk about the defense, obviously, there was a total rewind on the offensive side. On the defensive side, I know what you're saying about can Mike Rumpf recruit. Listen, um, I, I, whether he can recruit or not, like uh, I, I think I think he can personally. But again, I'm biased. I think he's a great coach, and I think I think you need great coaches on your staff. As far as recruiting goes, like Pat Key may not be a great X's and O's coach for linebackers. But maybe he's a better recruiter. I don't know. I, I don't. I haven't talked to Manny personally off the record about how he lines his staff up and who's responsible for what. But it's really important to know that a lot of times you may see that X coach is recruiting this player and he lost out, or this coach isn't in on a player and they got him. But really, it's a team effort um, and. It really, you know, you're limited in the number of assistants you have, and you really right. have to make your staff work for you as far as who's the the brilliant X and O's guy, who's the guy that's going to be a motivator. Um, and like, for instance, if I go back to, and I'm always going to go back to championship caliber teams because that's what we base our success off of. If I go back to the 2001 team, Curtis Johnston was, um, uh, listen, he may be, um, the most brilliant football mind. I I don't know that. And I interviewed and talked to and traveled with Curtis Johnson for years. I do know this. He got his players to freaking play, right? He motivated the crap out of his players. Uh, you know, to get a Santana Moss to come in wearing number 48 on a track scholarship to turn into one of the best wide receivers in the country and then in the NFL, to motivate a Reggie Wayne, to motivate all Andre Johnson who had to redshirt uh, you know, to, to, to play to the best of their ability. He was a motivator. That's why he was on the staff. And you talk to his players, and they'll tell you that, that every freaking day he was in their face yelling at them, getting them to get right so that they would play well. That's what he did well. Um, you know, as for the, his participation in game planning or recruiting and all of the other stuff, uh, it didn't matter because on that staff, Curtis Johnson was there to motivate guys. That's what that's that was his role. So uh, everyone has a role now on conversely. I do share some of your sentiments about whether certain guys are ready for prime time on the staff. And yes, I thought when Manny announced his original defensive staff that there was some of him bringing uh, too much from the from the bottom up to the top uh, as far as relationships go. But. I think a lot of people don't understand that, um, man, you got to feel comfortable. You you just got, as a head coach, you got to feel really comfortable, especially if your first time. I mean, look at your, like if I was to start a business today, right. Yeah. Wouldn't I reach out to people I've worked with before because 
there has to be someone I can, I can count on. Like when, right. when, when ish isn't going well, someone, there has to be someone that I know intimately that I know their wife. I know their kids. I know their family that I can talk to, that I can rely on someone I've been in the trenches with beforehand. If, if, if many had just gone out and just hired peeps off the, you know, off of whatever staff, but he didn't know them well. Well, how do we know that would have worked? Um, I mean, we certainly saw that in an offensive coordinator that he hired that he didn't know well, but had all of the, you know, all the, uh, the signs pointing towards this is right. the guy, this is the guy, but it didn't click and <laughs> it didn't work. Speaking of Dan Enos beast. I'd rather really? not, but we oh. can. <laughs> if you don't want to, it's fine. No, no go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> we always thought – it didn't matter who was going to be our next offensive coordinator. We would have a better offense with a high school offensive coordinator than Mark Richt. But statistically, it was worse. What went wrong with the offensive that coordinator? Was purely, that was purely wrong fit, man. It was just uh, wrong fit. Just completely wrong fit, stubbornness, Danny knows. Look, it, 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 was, it was clear to every single person um, that I know um, – that of walking age uh, that Miami in this day and age of offense should be running something spreadish, something utilizing athletes, right. uh, something utilizing the speed of the South Florida talent. And certainly like it, it, it gets frustrating. It's been frustrating. It's been like this for years, man, um, where you're looking out, on the landscape of college football. And, you know, I'm a junkie, man. I'm watching those Tuesday night games. I'm watching yeah. Max Shane. I'm watching it all. And you're seeing offenses that are going up and down the field with much lesser talent. And you're like, I don't understand how, like, why, how come Miami can't do this? And it's simply stubbornness of an offensive staff year after year that just refuses to implement something that is willing to work with the personnel they have. So I, I think that was the Enos problem. And um, I also think there was a lot going on in that quarterback room and in the offensive room um, behind the scenes that didn't make for great chemistry or great buy-in of what he was preaching. I think there was a lot of tuning D Dan Enos out. Okay, I see. And Beast, what have you heard about incoming offensive line coach Garen Justice? I know he was on Lane Kiffin staff, was the co-OC at UNLV because we need to fix offensive line play. We need to fix it now. Giving up nine sacks against Florida and Duke, I don't care if it's Dan Marino under center. You're not going to develop a good quarterback. You're not going to be successful with those stats. Yeah, so um, listen, I, I haven't met Garen Justice uh, I've only read some quotes and heard him speak on, you know, videos they put out and follow the tweets and what have you. But I do know I trust some guys and everything I've heard from Brian McKinney and Brett Romberg is yeah. that they love Garen justice. Okay. So right. I, I'll, I'll trust those dudes yeah. um, for, but again, the proof is in the pudding, right? So um, you can hire a guy that fits all the, you know, checks all the boxes, right? But if he doesn't connect with his players, if they don't play well for him, um, then it, his talent's being wasted or something's not working right. Um, there's really so much that goes into, uh, into college uh, coaching because you're so limited on – you're limited – on the amount of coaches you can have that you really have to get it right. Whereas in the NFL, I mean, you can have three guys that coach the offensive line. Um, so, uh, you know, you really have to get it right on all ends of the spectrum when you're hiring a coach. Absolutely. Hey, Beast, Manny Diaz, year one, offseason. He wins the offseason. People are going crazy about the transfer portal. This guy's brilliant. We take the offensive coordinator to be named at Alabama. We steal him from Nick Saban. Manny Diaz killed the offseason. Year one goes through, everyone loses their faith in Manny Diaz. He was the mayor of Miami. Now he's probably one of the most hated people in Miami to a certain extent. He wins the offseason again with his offseason hires, brings in De'Ara King, a first-round defensive end prediction. Are you buying back into year two, or are you on a wait-and-see approach? Um, I will tell you everything about this. So – let me just give you a little bit about me, okay? 
because I guess I'm at this point I'm I'm Gen X Canes fan as opposed to uh you know whatever millennial Canes fan or Gen Z or whatever <laughs> is going on out there. So I used to be as diehard as diehard can be when I'm when I you know when I was a fan when I was covering the team when I was on the sidelines when I was on the team plane I was right. on all the recruiting sites. Hell, I was following recruiting before there was websites when, you know, I had to wait for Gary Furman's actual real newspaper to get to my house in my mailbox to know what was going on with recruiting. OK, so like I used to be that guy that was all over off season and moves and new coaches and this guy and that guy. And then I grew up and I realized that none of it. None of it matters right now as far as what you're hearing, what you're seeing, what you think is good, what you think is bad, because what happens in the fall uh, is could be completely different. I can't tell you how many spring games I've gone to where some wide receiver looked amazing, had a, you know, a, a ridiculous spring game, right. right? And then come fall, he can't even make the field, okay? Uh, I've, I've seen a guy like, man, I'm going to go blast from the past. I've seen a guy that was as heralded a recruit as anyone had ever known, a lineman named Cameron Binion. He was going to come in and be the next great one for the University of Miami. And, and as it turned out, it was, it was great that he was on those teams back in the, in the, in the mid nineties, early nineties, because he helped bring the GPA up, but he never played and he sucked. <laughs> um, so, uh, you, you never know what you're going to get. Okay. And um, sorry to be very um, no, that's uh, completely fine. cliche, no, cliche, if you will. But yeah. um, I think I think if if we sit here and start judging the now, it's hard to get, not to get hyped. I mean, right. I I mean, hell, Manny Diaz steams into a, a a fundraiser on a boat on a yacht. I mean, you know, I'm swaggering around my house. Yeah. Um, I'm high fiving people on my street when we we're allowed to do that. Um, <laughs> and and I was jacked up as anybody. But I think when it comes down to it, is you just got you just got to wait, man. You don't you, listen. If you love this team, you you love it for the program. You right. love it um, because you just love what it stands for. And year in and year out, you just hope for the best when it comes to the fall. If you sit and judge the off season, if you if you try to get hyped by an off season, man, I don't know what to tell you. But um, you know, uh, the, uh, Dan Levitard, great radio mind, a great mentor of mine, guy I've worked with a little bit, always said we we love the transaction more than the action. Right. And and right. I think that's where we get caught up in the off season because we love all the scuttle button stuff that's going on. We want to buy in on De'Ara King and Roche and we want to buy in a new offensive coordinator. We we're getting hype. Yeah. But not a down of football has been played yet. So 100%. slow your roll. Absolutely. No, I, I completely agree. It kind of reminds me when the Yankees got Aaron judge and Giancarlo Stanton, they really haven't done anything. I know you're from Boston. You're probably a Red Sox fan. So I am, I am, but it's, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Um, speaking of transactions in the off season, how do you, in what ways can you think maybe that Rhett Lashley is a positive impact? What do you like from Rhett Lashley? He was a Broyles award finalist, so he does have some background, um, to defend, you know, the higher, but I mean, what, what, what have you seen so far that you think will, well, here's what I know is when they, when, when they hired Rhett Lashley, I went digging through where he's come from, who he's learned under, what he's done. And the good thing about Rhett Lashley is, yes, he believes in the spread, but he believes in two different concepts of the spread, okay? okay? And I think when people hear spread, they automatically think slinging the ball around the field, okay? Uh, just right. the, the ball's being thrown everywhere. And – Yes, there is a version of the spread where that's done. The air raid, they're throwing the ball everywhere, and Rhett Lashley knows that. But there's another side of the spread, kind of the Rich Rodriguez tree of the spread, right. where it spread it out and power run. Um, Miami, uh, a million times, I was on the sideline up in Morgantown facing Rich oh, yeah. Rodriguez's West Virginia team, and Miami just could not stop them from running the ball because it was spread and run. And at that time it was like, what the hell is this? We're, I mean, I remember on the broadcast, we called it Goonie ball. Cause we didn't even know what to call it. Um, and Rhett Lashley is really good at that type of spread too. So now you have a guy that can take 
the concept of spread offense, meaning, hey, we want to get the defense spread out so that we can take take advantage of where the holes in the defense are and put our fast guys there. Uh, we could do it with the pass and we could do it with the run. We don't have to lean on one or the other. And I think that's really good. Now, I don't know what percentage, if it's 50-50, 60-40, 40-60. I don't know what it's going to be pass run, but I know this. Here's a guy that knows – multiple versions of the same offense that can uh, definitely emphasize different concepts and different uh, formations and different things to do out of those formations uh, that gives Miami a much better uh, chance of having a good offense. Okay, definitely. Beast, I, um, I was thinking about this question while you were um, beautifully um, explaining Red Lashley's offense. I think it's going to be a great impact – on this team and plus too, a lot of the recruits do play to that kind of um, offensive scheme in high school here, you know? So I felt like past offenses, we're always trying to play power football. I feel like when we just rely heavily on the defense, which is what we did under Larry Coker a lot. Does university of Miami, and you said this very eloquently in a video after we lost to Louisiana tech, you, you explained it perfectly. Yes. The university of Miami do they care about football anymore? And I'm at, and I am told this every video I make. We do not care about football anymore. And I want you to just explain it to the fans because you did it perfectly. Um, here, here's here's the thing about the University of Miami and football. Okay, um, the University of Miami has, and this is going to be a little bit of a history lesson. So. I apologize. No, you're fine. This is awesome. Those of you who may not know, back in the 70s, the University of Miami was in a rut athletically. Um, they actually did get rid of basketball for a while and um, didn't bring it back. It was gone for five years from 1980 to 85. Um, and then they brought it back and then joined the Big East. Um, and that probably hurt Miami um, forever. That's I, I think I think having to start over again really hurt Miami um, in basketball. But that's a video for a different time. Um, at the same time, there was very strong uh, impressions that they were also going to get rid of football. Wow. Um, there was a board of trustees vote as to whether they would get rid of football or not. They had had really mediocre football since – you know, the, the, the years of the Mad Stork and Ted Hendricks and George Meyer and what have you. And after that, there was just a bunch of mediocrity, um, kind of like we've been in the last 15 years. And, you know, at the time, the University of Miami is really just a small university in Coral Gables, Florida. It wasn't a national university. It wasn't some, it wasn't some behemoth of a logo and a brand. It was just a little sunny university. They used to call it Suntan U. Uh, you know, like for, for instance, my mom grew up in Coral Gables. She knew the University of Miami because she went to see Janis Joplin perform there, <laughs> not because of anything going on uh, sports wise. So, um, so University of Miami was in a much different place. They almost got rid of football. And then they happened to luck out and um, start to recruit kind of almost by luck, uh, start to get some kids uh, locally who were good players, right? Um, and it started in the late 70s. And then Howard takes over in 79, and he decides he's going to – he looks around the landscape of Miami high school football, which was also always great, but those kids were always going other places. And he decides, you know what, I'm going to try to keep these kids home. Let's see if we can do something with this. And he creates the state of Miami that he called it like anywhere from I four South, he was just going to consider Miami and he was going to try to recruit those kids. And it became a thing where the Alonzo Highsmiths of the world got every other recruit to stay home and stay at the university of Miami and Howard lucked out and got those kids to stay home. And they won a championship in 83 um, when they had no business winning a championship. And what that did was, is that put Miami on the map as far as the program goes and winning a championship and then they continue to get great players. But behind the scenes, um, the university never really ramped up its game from a strategic and logistical and analytical standpoint and financial standpoint to keep up with what was happening on the field. So for a long time, the university of Miami was really the little engine that could playing big time college football. I mean, 
I remember when I was even when I was traveling with the team, we would uh, you know roll into stadiums like Clemson or uh, every stadium, the Virginia Tech, whatever, and they're building massive structures on campus and huge things, new part, new facilities, new things, and we're looking at what's going on at the heck back then, and it just wasn't happening, and we're just like, how do people expect Miami to compete? when nothing is at the same level it's just it's yeah. just not um i used to walk through the hex center and be like i can't believe this place has won five national championships because <laughs> you know there's leaks in the offices the the floor the carpeting's coming up no offense to don bailey who did a good job uh but uh like it, it just didn't make any sense they were winning in spite of themselves um without really preparing to to win on every other level and Finally, it's taken a long time, but okay. Finally, they got their indoor practice facility right, and finally they they they've gotten some more academics facilities, and finally some money's being spent. But it's it's been such a lag that now it's gotten to the point where that stuff doesn't even matter anymore. Um, so now, yes, we've caught up in some things, but now yeah. if you look around, and my my best anecdote is. Um, I was in the lock Alabama's locker room after they won the national championship down here at hard rock. Um, I knew a bunch of people. I know a bunch of people knew a bunch of people on Alabama staff, uh, not coaches, but uh, you know, other people, uh, advisors and whatnot on their staff that work in the athletic department. So I was allowed in their locker room and um, there wasn't enough room in the locker room for the amount of staffers they had that were football staffers. Wow. They literally had dudes just, you know, getting out of their khakis and dressing like in the middle of the floor. Like it was a mess. I was like, what the heck's going on here? He's like, well, we have a hundred plus staffers that aren't coaches. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, we have a hundred plus staffers that aren't coaches, whether they're GAs or, uh, you know, film assistants or whatever they call them, video assistants, recruiting coordinators, uh, you know, whatever title they give them, it doesn't matter, okay? They're there to help Alabama win. Miami is, is, has added but does not have that kind of infrastructure around its football program, and that's because it takes a shit ton of money. Pardon my uh, French. No, you're fine. Um, and the problem with it is, is that people have to understand this, the University of Miami in context. The University of Miami in context is a global university that has nothing to do with football. It's a global university because of its medical school. Um, and if you take a step back as a fan for a second, what would you rather have, winning football or trying to find a cure for cancer? Um, and the answer obviously is, you know, my wife's a cancer survivor. I would love the fact that they are doing that. That takes up billions of dollars. So the football to them um, is, is secondary. Um, and it really comes from the board of trustees. Uh, you have, here's the hierarchy of the University of Miami. Sure, you have Blake James. He's the athletic director, okay? And he's supposed to oversee the day-to-day -day operations of the athletic department. But who does he report to? Well, he reports to the athletic advisory board. Who are they? Those are members of the board of trustees who are specifically responsible for athletics. Where do they report to? They report to the rest of the board of trustees who are a much bigger organization who have many more concerns and worries about the university than just football. Um, and so when the athletic advisory board goes to the rest of the board of trustees and says, crap, we need to buy out a coach and go get a new coach. And we need to do X, Y, and Z for this many millions of dollars. They look over there and say, that's wonderful. This doctor over here is about to find the cure for renal cancer. Um, you pick. Um, so that's kind of the way things goes. Now we get on them and they should like, I, I, I've been all over David Epstein, who's the chair of the board of trustees and, and all for a, a long time, or I don't know if he's still the chair. He might be the, the like last chair. Um, but I think they do need to, to put more emphasis on sports and football and all of that stuff. Um, but the, the problem is, is that you have a president in Julio Frank that has no idea what college sports is. Um, now, luckily, we have him as the president of the university now because his background is in public health administration and following pandemics. So um, it kind of helps to have an expert in that field as your, your university president. But he's not a sports guy. Um, most of the board of trustees aren't sports people. Um, and so you have a university that 
um, maybe is known um, on one side of things for sports, but is trying to make it through something else, through academics, through medical research, um, and all of that stuff. And those two things go head, you know, go against each other in all of those board of trustees meetings, um, because you can imagine yourself sitting there trying to make a case that we need a new wide receivers coach. And some other dude is like, well, yeah, we can do that. Or we can get the new, uh, you know, PET machine that we need down at the Sylvester Cancer Center, uh, you know, to help our patients. And that's what it comes down to. Um, the thing is, Beast is the average armchair fan coach doesn't understand oh. that at all. It assumes everything revolves around football at UM. Huh. Oh, the thing is, Beast is... Oh, I get it. I thought he would call me an armchair coach. Yes, you are correct, Bergy. Okay, I thought you were... I was like, huh, what? Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, the, just basically, here's the, here's the here's the short end. Here's the... the th that cares about football. It's important to them. It does bring money. It brings money because of two things. Okay? Do you know what those two things are, Paul? Uh, please name them. I'm, I can't think of it. Okay. Adidas? Adidas. Conference TV money. Those are the two most important things to this athletic department. Everything else, ticket sales, uh, selling of jerseys, anything else you can think of, any other revenue stream is just uh, bumpkiss. Carol the only thing, Yeah, uh, all of that does, is nothing compared to Adidas and ACC money. That's all nice. that matters. So, so whether they win or and, and the thing is, is whether they win or lose right now, it doesn't matter because they still get Adidas money and ACC money. And it's a lot. It's a ton. That makes everything go. Beast, speaking of ACC money, yeah, I want to ask you a question. Was it a bad decision? Now, hear me out if people just flip out. Was it a bad decision to join the ACC in football and maybe as a whole? Yes. Okay. Um, here's why. The ACC, while never great at football, um, had its bleep together because of basketball. Um, the institutions themselves had 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 their ish together because they were such so good at basketball that their athletic departments were were already really well organized. Um, football was kind of secondary. Um, I, I think you know going to the ACC. I don't think Miami understood what kind of investment in all aspects of football and basketball and baseball and everything else they would have to make in order to compete. And because Miami, I mean, I don't think people realize this. And when I tell people this, that it, like, you know, back up in Boston, like, yeah, there's 10,000 undergrads at the university of Miami. Yeah. You know, people are like, what? There's not like 30,000. I thought it was a huge football school. No. It's a medium-sized school. It's in a little, you know, suburb of Miami called Coral Gables. It's it's not a big school at all. And I think, you know, when you when you look around the ACC and you see behemoth schools yes. or um, or schools that have been around for you know since the 1800s or all of this stuff, you realize that you know Miami was joining a different place. Now, um, I think what could have happened and it was explored was at the time. Fox offered Miami a Notre Dame type TV deal to be an independent. And they passed up on that in order to join the ACC. Um, I don't know how that would have gone. Um, maybe that would have washed and burned too, but it would have been interesting to see because at the time, Miami, remember when Miami joins the ACC, they're, they're at the heights of heights, right? That's coming off national championship. That's coming off great seasons. That's like, Man, things are going great. The basketball team had just been to the Sweet 16. Like the, the baseball team had just won a championship. Like Miami could name its price at that time. Uh, fool people and name its price. And man, if they'd gotten the sweet Notre Dame deal, like, hey, we're kind of in a conference, but we're independent and we're getting our own TV money and what have you, that could change things drastically. Uh, Beast, I think you hit it nail in the coffin. You know, Miami was one of the last schools in the ACC to have an indoor practice facility. And, you know, looking at our facilities, Green Tree, yeah, there's so much history in Green Tree, but we need to modernize. Our Hall of Fame, if you go visit our Hall of Fame, 
it's not really well funded. If you go to North, well, Carolina, oh yeah, well, here's, here, here's the thing. The, you know, the hall of fame has really no relationship with the athletic department, right? It's an really? independent, it's okay. an independent 501 C. So, uh, it just rents space from the okay. school to be there. Oh, so that's why, that's why they have the hall of fame banquets and all the whatever. So people can help contribute money to do a rehaul. They don't get money from the university of Miami athletic department. Um, so yeah, you're right about the hall of fame and I love the hall of fame and I I've been asked to actually be on the hall of fame committee a couple of times. Um, and I've been to their meetings and they're a great organization. They simply only get their money from fundraising. So, um, you know, that's why it's important that we help them out, but they don't get a dime from the athletic yeah. department. And you look at North Carolina's hall of fame. Have you yeah. ever, it's nice. It's very nice. Oh, I've been to North Carolina's I've been to Duke's. Uh, I've been, I've been to a bunch of places where I've looked around and going, man, this is pretty amazing. I was out at, uh, I got a, uh, uh, when Miami played baseball in a regional out in Lincoln, Nebraska, um, we used wow. a, an engineer in our radio broadcast who was also the executive engineer for Nebraska football broadcast. And he had the key to everything. He had the key to every place there was in Memorial stadium out in Nebraska. And, uh, we, I went to places you're not supposed to even go to like their hall of fame and like what they've got going on and how they display everything. I mean, I was, I almost fainted. I was like, man, this is when we get in this right. and you just, you just realize it's just because those schools are huge and they organize things differently. Uh, Miami's not like that. It's a little engine that could just keep thinking of Miami as a little engine that could, and then it will explain everything. And beast looking at the previous coaches we've hired. Randy Shannon, defensive coordinator, Larry Coker, Al Golden. We, we fairly went under the rug, you know, cheap diamond in the rough we were trying to look for, which we we got in the past. I have a question for you. Does the University of Miami as a whole, when they make these hires, do they look for a certain profile in the next head coach? And I'll give you two examples. I heard Mike Leach. He's an odd guy. He's odd. He's weird. I mean, he's just straight up weird. We're not going to hire Mike Leach because he's just odd. Mike Gundy, uh, you know, he doesn't – he's from Oklahoma State. Mike Jimmy Johnson went there, but I don't know. We've heard some dark rumors about him per se. Manny Diaz, look at what his father did. Look at his family's name in the city of Miami. Clean-cut guy. Is there a certain candidate they're looking for, or are they looking for the best candidate they feel like to win football games? I mean, I, there, I don't think there's one prototypical Miami coaching candidate. I do think – um, up until recently with Mark Richt, um, but that you know the Mark Richt situation kind of fell into their lap, and they whether you like Coach Richt or not, and whether you thought that he did well at Georgia or not, or you couldn't get over the hump, whatever. Like when you get a, a big name coach that is uh, an alum that wants your job, you 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 just you you take a chance, you do it right. But other than that, I think what Miami. Uh, looks for in a coach is unfortunately, I think is value. <laughs> um, um, and I think the other thing they look for is someone that's not going to embarrass the program um, personally. Um, the Mike Leach situation. Uh, I don't want to get into the details and uh, like he, 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 he refutes the story, but I have it from a person in the room that his interview uh, when they were thinking about hiring Mike Leach, matter of fact, he had Donald Trump write him a, a letter of recommendation um, and uh, send that to Donald Shalala. But when he when he interviewed, he he blew the gig. Um, he blew the gig. And a lot of the same board of trustees members that were around for that hiring thing are still around. So you're not going to convince them uh, to hire him because of his performance in an interview that he did you know, 10, 12 years ago at this point, which whether you agree with that or not, it would get it, give a second chance, blah, 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 whatever it is. Uh, he blew it and he's not going to get a second chance. But as far as, uh, and, and no, as far as Mike Gundy goes, that guy's not working out here in Miami. I mean, he's Miami's a multicultural, uh, multinational, um, city. Right. And, uh, Mike Gundy would stick out, uh, like a sore thumb. Uh, walking around the Grove or South Beach. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, man! I, it would have been. I think there was a certain time where certain coaches um, 
like Mike Gundy, um, really Coach Patterson from TCU, where they were like hot names, had the ball rolling. I, you, sometimes I always wonder if maybe getting another coach from the state of Oklahoma. Everything comes in three. Maybe it could be our next uh, godsend, Jimmy Johnson, Butch Davis. So I always wondered at those things. Yeah, uh, I mean, listen, listen. I, I and you know they may end up. As, you know, I don't. I'm not ruling out the state of Oklahoma. I mean, they got Dennis Erickson from Washington State. Yeah. You know what? <laughs> what did he know about Miami? They got La Larry Coker was from Oklahoma. Um, was an assistant oh, on Bush's staff. Yeah. You know, he wasn't Mr. Yeah. Miami. Right, um, yeah. You know, the only real Miami guys have been, well, Randy. I mean, Mark Rick grew up in Boca um, and uh, Randy Shannon, Miami guy, and Manny Diaz, Miami guy. Uh, right. You know, so um, it, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, Al Golden didn't belong um, and it really showed after a while. Um, and you know, some other guys have, and some other guys haven't. Hey beast. I want to ask you a question regarding the Ed Reed hire. Is that he's not even in the state of Florida. I think right now it is, was that smokescreen or no, Ed Reed is here to work and improve the program and talk to recruits to close the deal. Is that a I think, it's, I think, I think it's somewhere in between. Okay. I think basically is Ed, you do what you want to do. If you want to be hands-on and down here every day, you can do that. Okay. If you want to consult from afar, you can do that. Um, you know, Ed Reed is still living post-football life. Um, he's still got a bunch of obligations that he can do. Absolutely. But Ed Reed, I, I listen, there's been times, you guys, when Ed Reed has been out at practice coaching all week and no one's seen a thing or known a thing. Um, it, You know, he, he will be in disguise. He'll be out there and... He will. He comes down all the time just to to work with guys, watch film with them, um, and he decided, you know what? Instead of just me hopping on a plane and doing this every once in a while, uh, I might as well, you know, be a part of the program. So for me, listen, Ed Reed's a young guy. You know, I don't even know is he even forty yet? Uh, maybe just turned forty. Um, he's got time. Um, so we got Ed Reed on the uh, on the payroll, as they say. Not that he needs money. But I, I think as time goes on and he gets further away from his NFL career, he's going to, you know, if, if he wants to, uh, I think he's going to assert himself more in day in, day out operations okay. uh, with the University of Miami. So he's kind of, uh, you know, he's playing consultant right now. And they basically told him, hey, you, you, you come and go when you want to, when you have to. You're on speed dial. If we need you, we know when we can call you. If you want to come down, come down. You got an office. Gotcha. Okay. Because I wasn't sure myself. I'm like, well, how is this going to work out? You know, I, I wouldn't think someone, you know, in the city of Miami constantly on campus would be the right guy. Beast, Manny Diaz, man, year one was the definition of a circus. Okay. It was from the social media to the end of the season. It was, I mean, I could say the word, but. I don't want to curse on my live channel. It was just, it was a circus. It literally was. Can he survive another mediocre season or what's the magic number? For no. Okay. No. Uh, listen, uh, again, things are weird, right? In this, in this world we live in right now. Um, but for me personally, if Miami doesn't get to the ACC championship game, um, I'm going to be really upset. Even if now, it's two and by default, UNC gets well, no, like there's a couple of like asterisks, right? Like yeah, if, right. If, if they're tied and like something weird happens, but they have 10 wins, like, okay, I'm fine. Like, okay, no worries. But they certainly can't have a, you know, there's no six or seven win season that's going to keep Manny Diaz. Eight wins. I don't even know if that does it. Um, at some point, um, the natives get restless. And I think the most important thing is that Miami does not lose games against teams that they just shouldn't lose to. Yes, upsets happen all over college football all the time, um, but they're only supposed to happen once in a blue moon. The Michigan, uh, you know, Appalachian State, right? Everyone remember th th that turned the college football world upside down, but it wasn't like that was happening every week. To Michigan. Well, Miami, that was like happening like four weeks in a row or however many it was. Um, 
and then FIU and then the bowl game. And it just, it just kept going. That can't happen again. That can't happen again. Um, you can't lose to a Georgia tech They're They were horrible. Um, you just can't, can't do that. So I think, I think it's going to be a week by week measurement for Manny Diaz, but certainly I think Miami needs to have their sights set on getting to the, uh, the championship game. And, and by the way, I see the comments coming in. For those of you that are saying Manny Diaz is not the guy, like your sample size needs to be bigger than one year. Unless you win, unless, unless you're a Cam Cameron and you win no games or one game, you know, for the Miami <laughs> Dolphins, like, yeah, okay, then you, you cut ties. Right. But, right. you know, if you see some sort of like improvement and he's fixing things and he realizes his mistakes, you got you to gotta give a guy another season. Right. You just can't. You just can't because then it becomes, well, crap. Miami fires their coach every year uh, or they, you know, demand that they retire or resign. Why would I want to go work there? No, absolutely, Beast. And, you, you know, you make a great point. You know, Butch Davis, people forget when he first started here, five and six, eight and he three. He was a mess. Yeah, no, it, I mean, Rome wasn't built overnight. Right, Correct. Kirby Smart, he goes. Was it five and seven, seven and five first year? Yeah, no, I mean, there was a, uh, you can look around college football and see that there's been a bunch of coaches that have taken two or three years to get to the levels that we that they're at now. And Manny Diaz wasn't kicking field goals. Okay, correct. <laughs> I mean, now, the, now the decision making of switching back and forth between kickers, just hoping one makes it throughout a game, I, now that bothers me. I feel like just stick with one, but you didn't recruit those guys. And there was a culture problem at the University of Miami. I don't know where it came from, but there, there, there was a culture problem. Believe me. Oh yeah. Be Beast. Now I have a theory. If Manny goes, if Manny's gone, I think Blake James is gone. Remember Blake James, he hired Mark Rick, but if you hire someone and then they retire three years later, that's a bad hire. That's not good. There's a lot of pressure. Do you see the same scenario happening or Blake James is, Next yeah, time. for the most part, I, I think their futures are kind of tied together. Yeah, um, uh, I think. I mean, there's a there's a couple of odd things that could happen that that may not be so. Um, now, the board of trustees has really been willing to support Blake a lot. Um, he has a lot of people in his corner, um, and it's all politics, man. I wish you guys oh, could yeah. know. Absolutely. I wish you. I wish you guys could understand and know the politics that goes on on that campus on every campus and what goes on behind the scenes and how, like who has the money and who's buying influence and like all this stuff. I mean, I wish I could write a book. I don't have the patience to it, but someone will. Um, it's just, it's just unbelievable. But right now the people are on Blake's side, but uh, uh, if this, if this football team goes out and lays, lays an egg this year and doesn't have a good year. Yeah. It, Blake's going to be gone too. Wow, absolutely. And plus a six hour coaching search. I mean, that's where the University of Miami, like, I don't, how do you only have a six hour coaching search? Literally. So I always thought that was very interesting as well. I feel like they went out, they said, Hey, what's Mario's quote? How can we get this thing done? And then it was just too deep and probably Nike has them in the right um, wallet. So It'll be very interesting to see what happens moving forward. Hey, beast, man, you've seen a lot of coaches, assistant coaches, head coaches, who was always that guy you felt like could get the job done at Miami or any, maybe a coach in college football that you would love to see at Miami, given an opportunity. Are we talking like presently or like of all time or. Yeah. I mean, I would say presently right now you think. Um, I, that, well, heard, like I know, I know like you're, you're kind of pointing me towards like if Manny fails, who would you hire? If you're the AD. Yeah. I mean, because I, I would love Joe Brady, for example. I mean, I, I think he's he's very ahead of his time, and he's he's a diamond in the rough. Came out of William and Mary. Yeah, I'm. Listen, here's here's. I don't ha I don't have a name for you, okay? Because I hate speculating right. about this stuff when someone's still in the position. But um, but I will say this. Here's what I think are, is really important to be a head coach at the university, specifically at the University of Miami, which is so completely unique to every other school uh, out there. Um, which is this: one, understand the athletes you'll be coaching and recruiting, right? Understand your talent base and what you have. Really important. Two, 
understand uh, the ACC and the competition that's there and the other teams on your schedule and that you'll be playing primetime games under the lights with long walks from the locker room. Um, really important. Three, um, really get the atmosphere of the University of Miami and its fan base, okay? But four, I think just be really astute, smart, and edgy in some way. Um, mostly, I would uh, instead of instead of edgy as in, I don't mean swagger like you know with the turnover chain. I mean edgy as in you're on the edge of your defense or your offense is groundbreaking, is forward thinking, is yeah. is something that is next generation, right? Yeah. Um, you want to get it. Miami's always gotten the guys on the upswing. The Jimmy Johnson with his defense was on the upswing. Dennis Erickson with his offense has been on the upswing. So you like, you want to get guys that are just moving places with their side of the football. I think that's what Miami has to do. If, 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 and when they, they get a new coach. And I think, you, you know, you touched on it. Manny Diaz, you know, he is a smart guy. He messed up at Texas. It takes a lot for people to rebound after that one year of being a DC and getting fired. That's humility. Goes to Louisiana tech, works his way under Dan Mullen at Mississippi state and gets the job done at Miami. He is now the head coach. I think there's a lot of learning to do after year one. I think Manny Diaz, he's proven in the past. He adjusted his mistakes, like you beautifully said earlier, hiring Rhett Lashley. That might be the program changer we need at Miami and to maintain that offensive staff as well. Not a revolving door of coordinators. What's your season prediction, Beast? Yeah, I'm going to completely um... – I'm going to back out of that one. Here's why. Oh, here's why. Here's why. You asked me about coaches, right? And some of the greatest I've seen. Um, yeah. I'm not sure there's a better assistant coach that ever coached for the University of Miami than Donnie Salinger. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Miami Southridge. Um, he, he was on a couple of different Miami staffs on defense, on offense running back, special teams. Yeah. Um, and you look at the players that he coached and was around, and they all were amazing. And you think about that running back room at one point in time with McGahee, Portis, uh, James Jackson, uh, Jarrett Payton, um, Frank Gore came after James Jackson. But just all of the names that were in the same room, just ridiculous. And he, and he motivated them all. And Donnie Salinger's moniker, his, his not his moniker, but his 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 kind of mantra, if you will, okay, will always stick with me, and I will always use it when prognosticating as far as sports go and predictions, okay. And Donnie Salinger will say it day after day after day, and you could probably find him riding his bike around Coral Gables in South Miami right now, and he's probably saying it out loud to anyone that he sees, okay. And he's going to say this. I'm like Missouri man. Missouri is known as the show me state. He'll say, I'm like Missouri man. You've got to show me. Meaning, I don't give a bleep about the hype or this or that or predictions or, or, or what I think it's going to be. I want to see it on the field. Absolutely. And that's why I don't do the prediction game because I have no idea. <laughs> show me a show me a game. Show me something in pads. Show me someone tackling someone, and I'll give you my thoughts. But for me to sit here and tell you what this team is going to do based on Twitter or whatever uh, it would be asinine, completely asinine. Absolutely, and beast. If you, if you have enough time, would you like to do like a five minute just um, rapid fire questions they have in the comment section? Let's do it. First, I just want to tell everyone if we can. Uh, don't forget to follow me on the, on the yeah. social media at Miami radio beast. Uh, and also I do have a YouTube channel. I don't do anything live. I just opine on things, not necessarily even university of Miami things. It could be pandemic things. Uh, so look for that. And also, uh, the kid and I do a completely bizarre talk show every Tuesday and 30 Thursday, my 12 year old and I do a talk show from five to 6 PM Eastern on the hot mic app. Um, which has become really fun to work with my 12 year old. So go check those things out. Cool, let's do let's hit, hit me. What do you got? What do you got? Right, what do you got? Do what do you think about Derek King? Could he get it done? 
Yes, he could get it done. <laughs> no, um, I think it was a great move. I think I think everything I've studied about Derek King, the film I've watched, is um, is definitely a guy that I think we needed to get. I think we needed to go out there and solve our problem at quarterback. I think I think he could be a good answer. But again, you know, put 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 him out there in the ACC on. Uh, against competition of this caliber, and we'll see what happens. But, yeah, all signs point to him being the real deal. Assuming we have a great defense, how many points do you think we need to average to be really hard to beat? Ooh. Um, I don't know what the average should be, but listen, I don't I don't even care about the defense. Score 30-plus points a game. 30-plus points, and you think we'll do well. All right, yeah. sounds good. All right, I got a good one. Uh you can't compare Butch to Manny. Butch entered with the program on probation. Manny was there for three years prior. He wasn't new to the U. That is true. He was the defensive coordinator. Now he was the head coach. What do you think? Um, yeah, but but Manny had never been a head coach before. Um, and Butch came into the program with a pretty talented team in 95. The, 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 the scholarship issue really didn't hit until 97. Um and 95 and 96, um, he had some pretty decent talent. And there was just some bad coaching decisions that he made. I mean, uh, like, bad. Um, Butch was infamous for um, coming out of a TV timeout and not having the right guys on the field and having to call a timeout. Um, like, infamous for that. He could not get right. And it wasn't until and, – and listen, Butch, Butch may have – built the best team in ever in college football, but he, he couldn't coach it. Um, so, you know, and he went on from, you know, listen, what, yes, Butch Davis is having some decent success at FIU and not to take any way thing away from FIU. They beat Miami, but it's not exactly like he went on to become Nick Saban. So let's bring it back a little bit. Hey beast. Special teams at Miami. I mean, this that, that setup drives for us on the offense. What what the hell happened? Yeah, I yeah, you would. I mean, what what was once a hallmark of the University of Miami in kick returns and punt returns and uh, kick coverage and punt coverage has become just. I mean, every time they're on special teams, I I almost close my eyes. Uh, I don't want to know what's happening. Um, I don't know where it's gone. I don't know where it's been. I don't know what's happening there. Um, again, Donnie Solinger did a great job. And yeah. you don't, you know, and the thing about it is, is, and you do, you do now get one extra assistant, but you really don't, you just don't have enough bodies uh, to, to really get great special teams unless you have great coaches on your staff that can really have practice organized. Because what happens is, is so like, you know, like, one guy ends up being the special teams coordinator and then every other assistant coach has will be in charge of another aspect of special teams. Somebody is punt return. Somebody's kick return. Someone's kick coverage. Someone's punt coverage. Like they have all the assistants have an aspect of special teams. And if you don't have your practices organized the right way, and if you are working on that stuff the right way, week in and week out, it's not going to be good um, because college just doesn't have enough bodies on the coaching staff to work on it. Who's going to be that breakout wide receiver we see this upcoming season? Ooh. Do, 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 do. Give me some choices. Give me like an A, B, and C. Uh, uh, Jeremiah Payton, Mike Harley, Mark Pope, um, Dazzling Warsham, uh, Keyshawn Smith, Xavier Restrepo. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go with Mike Harley. Mike Harley. I yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I, 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 I think. Favorite. I think Mike Harley is the guy that's going to break out. Um, I'm starting to worry about Mark Pope. Am I the only one? On no, that? I've been on that since last year. Absolutely. Okay. Five star. They call him noodles in high school. I'm more, I like my guys already filled out when they're coming in as recruits. He's, I think he was a, he should have been a three or four star looking back at it. That's yeah, just, correct. Do you believe that in order for Coach Diaz to succeed, he would need to be surrounded by good slash great assistants, just like Dabo, just like many coaches in the past at Miami as well? Um, Of, of course. You need to have great assistants um, to – I mean, there's very few coaches that are great coaches regardless of what staff they have. Um, I mean, you look at the Patriots, right? They needed Josh McDaniel to come back to work with Belichick and Brady for them to win again. Um, 
and the best coaches surround themselves with great staffs. So yes, that needs to happen. Um, there's no doubt about it. The makeup of your staff um, is, is especially in college football, is hugely important because of the recruiting aspect. Do you think we have the best defensive line unit in the nation? I think we have the best it's, defensive ends in the nation. Yeah, I no, I mean, the outside is the best in the country. As for the inside, we'll see. Um, certainly have a chance to be up there, right? I mean, we certainly have a chance to be one of the great defensive line units in the country. Again, show me what we're doing. I, I, I trust the guys on the outside. Show me how we're doing on the inside, and I'll let you know. Cam Harris, more of a scat back in Lashley's offense. We don't let know me yet. see. So yeah, let me see. Let me see a game. Let me let me see what Rhett Lashley is running, and I'll tell you what Cam Harris can be. I don't know. Um, it's it's. Listen, I would love to sit here and play the chess too, where I start putting guys in and putting formations and imagining what this guy can do and this guy can do. We have no idea. So to speculate would be uh, absolutely crazy. But Cam he's, Harris is talented. Re he he has really good. surprised me. His growth has surprised me. He's very good. I have one more question. Okay. Where did the genesis, the idea of, hey, let's declare for the draft and let me get drafted in the sixth round or let me just get undrafted as a free agent at Miami. Where did that come from? Where, where did that mindset come from? Because I see other teams when, when their players declare for the draft, they're getting drafted in the first round, second Here, here's, or third. Here's the problem with the University of Miami, and this has been going on for 15 years or 20 years. It's been going on for a long time. Um. And I don't know the particulars because I, like, ag again, I used to, I used to get into all that stuff. And now I just, I, I don't want to know about it, uh, whether on either side, I don't want to know about what goes on on the recruiting side uh, on the streets. And I don't want to know what goes on on the agent side on the streets, but I've been told by many very good sources that the people that hang around these players uh, whether whoever it may be um, is just constantly feeding them bad information. Oh. Um, and unfortunately, um, unfortunately, the, I, I think that friends and family are buying into this. And then that becomes another layer of, Hey man, so-and-so says you're going to X, Y, and Z. And when your mom or your aunt or your dad or your brother or your friend or the people in your hood, whatever are telling you, Hey, bro, you're better than this. Uh, you know, you're you're much better than what they did with you at Miami. You could be this in the NFL. So and so says that pressure comes, and I know that a lot of people will say, "Well, it's a financial thing, and people have family to support, and all of that stuff." And and I understand that, and that's a huge, bigger socioeconomic argument that I'm not going to get into. But I think you'll find, um, I'd much rather. Listen, when you're a student at the U or any college, your your life is paid for. Okay, you don't have to worry about anything. Now that doesn't that may not help, may or may not help your family depending on what college you go to. Uh, some colleges in the SEC, it may very well help your family to stay in school. Um, in some colleges and other conferences, it may not. But uh, that's a wink, wink. Um, but I would say this: you, you're better if if you're not going to be a, a a first day pick or even in the first three rounds, let's say three rounds. If you're not going to be in the first or second day of the NFL draft, just keep your ass in school. Like, what's the point? You, I mean, yeah, a minimum is $465,000 or whatever it is, but your chances of making the team, the further you are drafted down the line, get less and less. It's much easier for them to cut you uh, when you're a seventh round pick than it is when you're the third round pick. So have faith in yourself that if you stay back, stay another year, you can make yourself better. And stop listening to all the birds chirping around the program. Um, it, it's it's really a problem down here. It really is, and I think it's because of just the city of Miami and 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 the metropolitan area that it is. It's it's easier to um, it's easier to control that stuff in smaller towns. Beast, it was a pleasure to have you on. I'm telling you, it was an honor. Brian the Beast London, everyone. He is a local local Miami radio legend. I'm telling you guys. Hey, thank you so much, Beast. It was more than an honor, man. You're the Anytime. man. Anytime. And if you guys have more questions, just uh, hit me up on Miami Radio Beast. We'll keep the conversation going. Otherwise, it. I'm going to go have a cold, hard one out on the uh, back patio. All right, guys. For all those 110 viewers, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Have a great rest of your day, guys.